you want to read ahead, we'll be in James chapter 1 next week. Today, however, before we actually begin uh, our, our next uh, study, uh, I was going to have you turn uh, with me in your Bibles to the book of Haggai. Now, I know that you probably have that marked because we mentioned it a week or two ago. So, you don't have to feel embarrassed. We won't hear any pages sticking together in that part of the Bible. But Haggai, as we mentioned, is a wonderfully rich book for, for all of its brevity. It's only two chapters long. Uh, it's a very, very short letter. Uh, it's considered, uh, Haggai's writing is considered one of the minor prophets, and minor only because of the length of the writing. Uh, the major prophets are, are called major because they wrote a lot, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on. Uh, the minor prophets like Haggai, Habakkuk, um, you know, some of the others, Joel, Amos, and so on, they wrote little bit by comparison, so they're called the minor prophets. I emphasize that because when you think minor, you tend to somehow think maybe less significant or not as important. But Haggai is a great example of why that's not the case. Uh, Haggai actually deals with some wonderfully simple yet tremendously profound truths that lend themselves, in my view, to a, a perfect place to start uh, this new season. Uh, Haggai's theme that runs throughout the book uh, is mentioned twice in the first couple of, uh, in the first chapter. Uh, however, the word appears a number of times later in the letter as well, and it's the word consider. And in particular, God tells the people, his people, to consider their ways as he speaks through the prophet Haggai. As a matter of fact, the letter to Haggai, brief as it is, can really be broken down into about five different sections. We're not going to go strictly speaking verse by verse through the whole uh, uh, letter this morning, but we are going to focus on a couple of things, and when we eventually get to the minor prophets, we'll go much more in depth. The letter to Haggai, uh, this prophecy that he gives, or from Haggai, I should say, this prophecy deals with wonderful themes. Not only does he call the people to consider their ways, but he talks about the coming glory at the end of the age and all of these kinds of things. Uh, we're not going to cover all of those things today, but I wanted to mention that uh, in part because the book is broken down in a number of ways. First off, God calls out to his people, calls them to consider their ways. He sees the error of the ways that they're walking in and calls them to consider them or to think about them, ultimately that they might change. Later in chapter 1, they do. About midway through, they do see a change, and uh, that carries through the rest of the chapter. Chapter two is broken down basically through God's encouragement to the people to continue on in the face of persecution and difficulty. Ultimately then he begins to, uh, uh, they begin to express their, their obedience to the Lord uh, and then ultimately God begins to speak of the days to come and the glory that is to come. Uh, all of that packed into these two short chapters. It's a really wonderful and rich book. We're however again going to key in on one particular area and I'm going to start by reading the first 11 verses as we begin. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore consider your ways. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, and the hills, on the grain, and the new wine, and the oil, and on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Now we'll read on in a moment, but let me just start there. These words certainly had their direct focus focus on God's people at that specific time, no doubt. Uh, they were in the process, they had begun rebuilding what we would call the second temple. However, that work had stopped. And while God had spoken to them specifically, God's chosen, for us to neglect the lessons that he's trying to get across to them would be ultimately to our own hurt. The word of the Lord dealt with the physical, literal temple that they were 
building at that time. The first temple, Solomon's, had been destroyed, and now they were rebuilding it, and ultimately would rebuild the walls around the city as well. Uh, however, that work had come to a close, and God was dealing with that. But I want to point out at the outset that the call of God on his people had far less to do with brick and mortar and far more to do with a thermostat. This week uh, was one of my favorite days of the year. It was International Coffee Day uh, on Friday. And uh, it's a wonderful day. It's a day we can all celebrate God's greatest gift to man uh, and uh, the wonderful caffeinated gift. But anyway, so it was coffee day, and uh, I couldn't help thinking about a quote from Vance Havner on this particular topic. Um, he was at a restaurant one time with a friend, and they were just having their meal, and, and uh, he had a cup of coffee. And as, as you know, as you finish your cup, or as you're near finished, maybe it's halfway through, the waitress comes by, or the waiter, and they say, oh, can I top that off for you? And he said, no, I'd like a fresh cup. I don't want any Laodicean coffee. <laughs> now, some of you know what that means. The church of Laodicea had become what we would call lukewarm in their commitment to the Lord. Uh, they had, in many respects, done well for a while, but they had waned. They had lost their passion. They had grown cold to the point where Jesus himself, uh, many years after this time in Haggai, as he deals with that church in Laodicea, he says, I would spit you out of my mouth. I wish that you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, therefore I spit you out of my mouth. Now, anybody that loves a good hot cup of coffee, when it gets lukewarm, it's not the same. It's not good. And while we may not necessarily spit it out, we understand the sentiment. God's desire is that his people not lose their fervor and their passion for him. That was what happened here in this time of Haggai. As a matter of fact, this is why the temple began to lose, or they began to, uh, I should say, uh, neglect the rebuilding of the temple. These are important lessons for us to learn. Paul in Romans 15 talks about how the things that were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the endurance, the patience of the Scriptures, might have hope. Uh, in other words, we never want to lose the context in which these things were written. But if we also then, in reading those things, neglect the practical and spiritual lessons uh, that are intended for us to learn, we can fall into the same error that those before fell into. When I talk about it having to do less with brick and mortar and much more to do with a the thermostat, what I'm speaking about is the spiritual temperature of God's people, both then and, of course, now. Because the danger is that we, as followers of Christ, might run into the very same problem that they did. What was their problem? Well, the temple had been destroyed and the rebuilding had begun, but they weren't finishing the work. Now, if you will put yourself back at that time, it's not that the work of the Lord that they had begun was out of view. Everybody could see it. Anybody could see what had started. It was there. The problem wasn't that it wasn't there at all. The problem is that where it existed was on the periphery of their attention, of their devotion, of their sense of priority. And that is what God is dealing with. The fact that they did not finish the temple was a literal problem, but it was only symptomatic. You see, some years earlier, before the, the temple was destroyed, and uh, Ezekiel speaks to this. In Ezekiel chapter 8, he talks about the sin that existed within the hearts of the priests and their evil practices and everything. And ultimately, by the time we get to Ezekiel chapter 10, we see that the glory of the Lord has departed from the temple. And Ezekiel saw it. But I have to wonder if anybody else did. We don't know that they did. We don't know that everybody saw this grand display of the glory of God at the doorway of the temple and then departing. We don't know if only Ezekiel saw that or if anybody else did or if business just went on as usual. We don't know. Certainly once a year when the high priest would go in and the presence of the Lord wasn't there, I wonder if they noticed at that point or if they saw it all happen. My fear is that for their case, and certainly this would equate in our lives as well, is that they may not have known until later, and they may have just continued on as if nothing had changed, when in fact the presence of God had departed. And I'll speak to that idea in a moment. He was found on the periphery. It was in view. The work of the, God, of the Lord was in view, but it wasn't a priority. Tozer put it this way. He said, the devil loves it when we say we believe and then prioritize everything in our lives ahead of God. The devil loves that. 
because we can continue being religious, we can continue walking uh, in a way that seems upright externally, but at the, in the middle, at the heart, in the furnace, in that place that burns within us, or at least once did, that place has gone cold. And while it may not seem overtly obvious on the outside, in time, as that continues to diminish, eventually it will find its way out in our lives. We can walk without, uh, without that passion for a time, but eventually it becomes obvious. If not to us, it certainly will to others. It certainly will to the Lord, first and foremost. Their job was to rebuild the temple. Why a temple in the first place? Does God need a house? No, not really. His presence fills the universe. As a matter of fact, he spans the universe with his hand. He doesn't need a place to, to live. But God has given us, or gave, I should say gave his people, a tabernacle and ultimately a temple for a couple of purposes. And one of which he's, he mentions here in verse 8, that he might find pleasure in it and that he might be glorified in it. Now that's significant. When God says to the people, my desire is that you build that temple that I might find pleasure in it, it's not again that God is interested in dwelling in houses made by hand. Solomon even said that after the grand temple that he built, when he dedicated it to the Lord, he said, this house is nothing that you should dwell in. it. You don't dwell in houses made by hands. Uh, there was a humility about that, a recognition that God's presence is far grander than anything we could build. If you remember in the, throughout the Old Testament, whenever God told them to build altars, how did he tell them to do it? Pile up rocks, right? There's no big, no chisel to it, no, nothing like that. It was intended to just simply be a pile of earth, if you will, that you would offer on, lest that pile of earth detract you from the beauty of the Lord. The ornateness of the structure somehow become the focus of attention. Solomon understood this. As grand as the temple was, he didn't for a moment think that the temple was supposed to be the focus. It was simply the house that his father wanted to build for the Lord, but that the Lord didn't let him build. And Solomon was able to build this, and in his dedication to the Lord, having said these things, the presence of the Lord filled that temple with smoke. It was a glorious thing as God's presence filled that place. He found pleasure in it. It was a place of worship where people could come to him. Now, the fact that God would find pleasure in this is the significant point, because to this point... As, as, as Haggai speaks to the people, their focus has been on their own pleasures, on their own satisfaction, on their own priorities. And God said, finish the temple that I might find pleasure in it. Hey guys, wait a minute. You're building your own lives up and doing this, but wait a minute. I have been pushed aside while you're doing this. That's what the Lord is saying to them. Finish this place that I might find pleasure in it and that I might be glorified. It is within the heart of man, sadly, tragically, to, on the, on, on the one hand, have a genuine relationship with God. We believe the things we're supposed to believe. That's good. We even practice our faith in some ways. But if the fire begins to go out, it becomes difficult for us to be glorifying God with our lives, we who are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Those who are the temples out in the world don't necessarily glorify the Lord. If the passion dies, as we said earlier, it begins to be demonstrated through our lives as we begin to become casual about what it means to walk with God. This was happening in their time. And God was calling them out and saying, no, finish this place that ultimately I might find pleasure in it and that I might be glorified in it. The second reason for the tabernacle and then ultimately the temple was because it was a place of meeting. As a matter of fact, the tabernacle in the Old Testament is often called the tent of meeting, the place where God can meet with man. Imagine that for a moment. God wants to meet with us. Wow. You know, most, most, all religions in the world have within the core of their belief system some sense that we have to try to reach up and touch heaven somehow. The Tower of Babel was set up for that purpose. We will ascend to that high place, very reminiscent of the heart of Satan, by the way. But they wanted to build this, this ziggurat, this, this, this structure that would reach up to the heavens where they could be seated in the heavenly places with the gods, as it were. Every belief system outside of our Christian faith has something to do with that pursuit, reaching up to God. 
but the thought that God has given us a place that we might come and meet with him, the invitation being open, the call to come being given to all men, because God desires that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Staggering thought. That's why God gave it to us, that we might come and meet with him. Now, yes, his presence fills the universe, and it's impossible for us to meet with him in that sense. But for him to come to a place that we might come. Now, his people in the Old Testament were given the privilege of that. They would bring their offerings, their sacrifices. They would worship. They would, uh, they would, the activities that they would perform would ultimately point to the coming of the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. These acts of worship looked forward to the day when God would fulfill his promises. And they were privileged to be able to do these things as a testimony to the world. And so when the time came and the temple was destroyed as they went into captivity... And as the time has now come for them to rebuild, and they have sort of set it to the side, this is a tragedy. This isn't just an offense. It's a tragedy to think so little of what that place meant. The fact that, and this is really where the problem was, and this is the problem that we have to be careful about, that we don't allow the, the worship and the devotion that God deserves, and that honestly... When we're doing, we know we're doing what we're created for, but that that loses its sense of centrality in our lives. When no longer is it the most important thing in our lives, critical, vital, necessary for us as people to come and to dwell with God, when that begins to be put aside, that is a tragedy of equal proportion to what we've been talking about. It's interesting that twice in those first 11 verses, God says, consider your ways. Now, whenever you're in the New Testament and Jesus says, truly, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you, or verily, verily, I say to you, for you KJV folks, when you see verily or truly, it's important. Listen up. When he says truly, truly, you really better listen up. This is really, really important. Well, twice in a very short span, God tells his people, consider your ways. Think about this. The, the term literally speaks of, 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 of examine your heart and the actions that are coming as a result. That's the idea that's being conveyed. Uh, your ways, your activities, your actions, consider those things. Why? Because they are symptomatic of where your heart is. Jesus said such things when he says, you know, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where your heart is, there where your treasure will be also. And things like that, that remind us of the connection between that which we express outwardly and that which we are anchored to inwardly. Those things are connected, and it's important that we never forget that. As a matter of fact, it's important that we look at those activities, those actions, those words, the way we carry and conduct ourselves, because those things are a barometer for our spiritual temperature. I like the way Harry Ironsides put it. It's a summons to self-judgment. Consider your ways. It's a summons to self-judgment for the ways manifest the state of the soul. Therefore, set your heart on your ways and your actions. Ponder earnestly, as another commentator put it, whether you have gained by seeking self at the sacrifice of God. What have you gained by setting him aside that you might pursue your own desires and pleasures and comforts? It's a concern that we all have to consider. It's a concern that we all have to be wary of. Our spiritual temperature will become evident through our action or, as is the case in Haggai, our inaction. God saw right to the heart of where they were. He said, you're building your own paneled houses while mine lay in ruins. Now, it's important to note that to build paneled houses was a big deal. You didn't just go to Home Depot and get lumber. You didn't just run over to Lowe's, get the building materials, and just kind of put your house together. It took effort to get wood to panel houses. Uh, and the fact that God's house, as it were, God's house was left in ruins, but they were still putting the effort into building their own spoke volumes to where their hearts were at. It wasn't like they just sort of, or today we get on Amazon and order stuff, right? I mean, we don't have to leave our, we could, matter of fact, you might be ordering something right now for all I know. We don't have to go anywhere. Just pull out your phone. Matter of fact, you can have it delivered here. You know, we, we can do stuff. You can call Jimmy John's and have a sandwich while I'm preaching. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a great idea. 
Um, but, you know, it's like things are so convenient that we lose the sense of what it took to do the things that they did. Think of something that you really undertook that took a lot of effort, a lot of resource, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, maybe it's your house, you know, you, whatever you did. Just something that took some real effort, thinking, planning, doing, going places to get it. That's multiply that many times over and that's what it took for them to do it so this was not a their own pursuits were not casual for their own comforts and it became easy for them to lay aside the single most important pursuit of their lives in lieu of much lighter ones Again, that's why I think it's interesting, uh, you know, how this other commentator put it, ponder earnestly whether you have gained, whether or not you have gained, by seeking self at the sacrifice of God. Have you, in fact, gained anything by prioritizing your own wants over his? That's a fair question, and it's a probing question, and it's one that the Lord would have us all ask ourselves for the sake of drawing us close to himself. Remember, God doesn't indict the people because he's trying to push them away. He's letting them know what's going on in their own hearts when they have long since overlooked it, that they might come near. Again, God's desire, young people, old people, you're never too young or too old to think about this. God's desire is for you, that you would come near, that you'd walk with him, that you'd have a meaningful relationship with him that lasts through your days. I don't want to get on a soapbox and talk about how we in Western Christianity, but you know, we in Western Christianity, <laughs> um, we take very casually that thought because we just show up at church and everything. It's easy for us. We get 15 Bibles in our house and everything. We got access to all kinds of stuff. It's easy to be a Christian in our culture in many respects. To walk with God shouldn't have to be hard in a sense, but it should mean enough to us where we hold it in high enough priority, where suddenly the cost is maybe something else that takes me away from that, uh, a time pursuit that pulls me away from the time I could be with him, uh, an interest that has become all-consuming at the cost of my, uh, maybe my daily pursuit with him and spending that time with him, whatever that might be in your life. I mean, we all know our own things. I've got mine, you've got yours. These are things we have to confront, we have to think about and pray about and ultimately bring before the Lord. You see, they had ceased to see that honoring and worshiping God was as vital and central to their lives as it was supposed to be. Now, it's worth pointing out, too, by the way, that they had not long before been released from captivity that they might come and rebuild the temple. Uh, during this time, Zechariah is prophesying, the time uh, of that which uh, Isaiah spoke about when he spoke about Cyrus. And one day Daniel brings this word from Isaiah to Cyrus. He reads it and he's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. How could he call me out by name so many years before and all this kind of a thing? And so they're released finally to go and rebuild. And only a number of them go back. They don't go back in mass. But those that go back, go back with a passion to rebuild. But they don't. They stop after a while. They begin to struggle balancing their priorities, and ultimately God takes a back seat. Over time, the fire and the passion had ultimately died. And so God called them. He said, consider your ways. And notice what he says here. Uh, he says, you've sown much, verse 6, and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages does so and puts them in a bag with holes. You looked for, for much, verse 9, and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Uh, verse 11, I've called for a drought on the land. Or verse 10, the heavens above have withheld their dew, and the, the earth has withheld its produce. I've called for a drought on the land, and the hills, and the grain, and so on. What is he saying to them? The fact that you have come to a place where I am no longer the priority, I have sent you a wake-up call. You went out and you tried to labor, but it was to no avail. You tried to satisfy your hungry, to hunger to no avail, satisfy your thirst to no avail. You tried to cover yourself to no avail, to take care of yourself, to build comfort and wealth to no avail. And notice what he says last. I love what he says. I called a drought on the land. Uh, it's interesting, right in between chapter 1 and chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, between uh, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2 is where Zechariah begins to preach. 
and he also is calling the people back to their priority. The work has begun. They've been stoked up once again, but they've also begun to wane under the, the, the strain of, of, uh, of resistance in that. Uh, and so Zechariah speaks to them and calls them to return to the Lord, and he will return to you, is his famous statement in chapter 1. But at the end of Zechariah, as he talks about the kingdom age and all of this, he talks about in verse uh, in uh, chapter uh, 13, I think it is, where he says that in those days, all man will be called to come and to worship in Jerusalem. And then he says this, and for those who don't come, I will send upon them no rain. Now, I don't mean to sound trite. I don't mean to sound like I'm just looking for a pithy little thing to say uh, in, in the context of that statement. But what Zechariah says there and what Haggai says here, what the Lord says to the people here, uh, tells us at least one thing, if I can put it simply. When you determine or when you fade back in your devotion, whether it's intentional or unintentional, you find yourself far from the Lord where you once were, God's going to make sure, spiritually speaking for you, it's going to be very dry. It's going to be dry. How many of you have experienced a dry season in your Christian faith? Sure. I envy those of you who didn't raise your hands. I hope, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're telling me the truth because we don't lie in here, right? So, but the Lord is going to make sure that if you drift far from where you once were, He's going to make sure you know. He's going to make sure that you find out. And one of the ways that He does that is by giving us that sense that we are not experiencing the richness of what our, our, our life with Christ once was. And we use a term like dry to describe that. I'm in a dry season. My relationship with Christ seems to have gone dry, that kind of a thing. God's desire is to pour out his richness and bounty in, in the lives of those who love him. doesn't mean I, I'm not trying to some prosperity thing, but we know what it's like when we're walking with God. We know what it's like to enjoy the relationship with him. Our prayer life is meaningful. Our, our time in the word is rich. Our relationships are strong. We find ourselves very energized and, 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 and it's easy for us to share our faith and just to, the, the things that interest us about the Lord are deep and hyper intensive. We just love... That's a, that's a season of richness. That's beautiful. That's a wonderful thing to be walking in. And when we begin to drift, something, some, something grabs our attention and begins to pull us away. Or maybe something happened in our lives that has caused us to walk away. We only do those things to our hurt. God's desire is not that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, as, this, as this develops here, as, as their devotion to the Lord uh, begins to wane and God calls to them, no doubt as he names these things, they, they notice it. They see it. You're right. When I'm going to work, I don't seem to ever have any money. When I'm trying to find my satisfaction in my physical hungers and thirsts, I'm never satisfied. God points to those things, and they realize it. How do you know that? Because when he calls them to change, thankfully, they do. Notice in verse 12. Uh, or, uh, yeah, in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. When Haggai brought word to them, they responded. They weren't so far gone that when the conviction of the Lord came upon them, they couldn't still turn. There comes a point where we can go so far from the Lord and we get so comfortable in the place that we are that when he sends conviction, we resist it. We don't want to be told this. I want all of this and Jesus too. Well, you know what? When God spoke to them, they responded. They weren't to that point. When God said, no, it's time for you to come back, they did. And what's the first thing that was, was an example of that is that they obeyed. They did what God said. They got back to work on the temple. They did what God had commanded them to do. What's a parallel for us today? When we find ourselves in a dry season and we have been told, maybe you're in that place today and you're hearing these words thinking, oh man, Lord, why here? Why did you have to catch me? Why did you have to point this out? Does everybody here know that I'm backslidden? Is anybody looking at me funny? You know, if that's you today or whenever you find yourself in that place, when God convicts you of that, when God convicts me of that, 
The answer is to respond to it. And response, responding to that means walking once again in obedience. Now, disobedience doesn't have to be some wildly sinful lifestyle. Disobedience can simply be walking away from that which God has called you to walk in. He's, uh, he's called us to walk according to his word. But when we're backslidden or where we're in a dry place, the word sometimes sits on the shelf and we don't pick it up and read it because we don't want to hear what God has to say because it might convict us about something in our lives, small though it might be. But returning to the Lord means returning to a walk of obedience. And let me tell you something. For those of you who hear the word obedience, and maybe this is more for young people, we hear the word obedience, and the first thing we tend to think is mom and dad telling me stuff i got to do. And if I don't do it, I get grounded or some kind of a thing. Obedience in the Christian life is a liberating truth. Walking in the ways of God is freeing. It keeps me from making the kinds of mistakes that trip me up. It keeps me from getting into trouble. It keeps me from messing my life up to the point where it goes beyond repair. Walking in the ways of wisdom, as God has said, is a good thing. So being called back to that relationship with God means walking in obedience, and we love that when we know the benefits of walking in obedience. They obeyed God. And notice it also says that they feared the Lord again, which is to say that a healthy reverence for God had once again been restored in their hearts. In other words, it's not just that you're outwardly doing what God has said and you're hoping that that's enough. You're allowing your heart once again to experience that season of refreshing that is rooted in a love and an awe and a reverence for God. Again, something that we don't often think of. Hopefully we do, but we may not think of God in terms of reverence and awe. We think of God as good. We think of him as faithful. We think he's great. We look at the universe as Christians and we say, man, that's amazing that you did that. And that's amazing to us, but that's not the same thing as worshiping God because he is even more awesome than that. He is even more worthy of worship than the things that we think are so amazing that he did. And our hearts, once again, are captivated by this. God pulls us back and says, no, you need to be here. And we look and we think, yeah, God, this is the place that I want to stay in. And we worship him and we think on him and we consider the deep things of God. And we rejoice that he's invited us to consider such things. And we respond in worship. Their hearts once again had a healthy reverence for the Lord. He wasn't on the periphery anymore. Now he was central once again. They obeyed the Lord, and they revered him once again. They feared him. And notice as it goes on, at the end of verse 13, Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. I'm with you. What a good word from God. You know, it's one thing when we're convicted of our sin, and we begin to feel terrible about the things that we have done. But what a beautiful thing to be reminded that God is with us. As we turn around, we've never gone so far that he won't still take us back. Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. Uh, most of you know this. Some of the kids may not be that familiar with it. But think about the prodigal. Prodigal means the wayward one, the one who went to the ways of the world and that. Well, a son, a man had two sons. And his one son uh, decided one day, the younger boy, decided he wanted his inheritance early. And so he said, Father, I want what I've got coming to me when you're dead. I want it now. And so the father gave it to him. That was a profoundly insulting thing to say to your father, especially in that culture. How many of you dads would like to hear that now? My daughter said, Dad, you know, I, you're cool and all, but I really want the stuff I got coming. <sighs> really? That would just be heartbreaking. Imagine what this father would have felt. And so the father gave it to him, and he went. And he squandered it on prodigal living. So we get that term, that idea of just on all the things that this world had to offer, thinking that would be where it's all at. This is where I really enjoy myself. Until the finances ran out, and suddenly he was broke. And he had nothing, and a famine had hit the land, and he had no resources of any kind. And so he's, he finally just gets a job just feeding pigs, which if you're Jewish, that is not a kosher thing to do. And so he's feeding the pigs and all this kind of thing to the point he's so destitute that the food that they're eating starts to look appetizing to him. Ugh. That's where he's gotten to. 
And finally he comes to himself. I love that. He comes to himself. He came to his senses. And he realizes, you know, the servants in my father's house do better than this. The hired hands are better off than I am right now. Dad treats them well, better than I am. And so he begins to think about what he would say to his father when he goes home. And he begins to rehearse this. this and I think it's heartfelt. But he begins to think, you know, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. But just put me to work somewhere out there and that will be enough. But as he draws close to his house, as he comes home, his father sees him while he's a long way off. He's looking for him to come home. And as the son approaches... His father runs out and greets him, embraces him, and his son begins to say, Father, I, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Enough. Enough of this. Get him a coat. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. And we're having a party tonight because you've come home. The older son, who, by the way, if you don't really know the whole story, the older son is representative of the scribes and Pharisees who feel that their good deeds have earned them a party like this. Why didn't I ever get one of these? And so he comes to dad and says, Father, I don't get why you're having a party for this deadbeat. I've never done anything like this. This is the message version I'm apparently quoting from. Uh, the, this deadbeat, he, he runs away with your stuff and he blows it all and everything. I've never done anything like this. I tithe. I do this. Thank God I'm not like this tax collector. Sound familiar? I'm not like your other son, dad. I've never done anything like this. Why don't I get a party? And his father said, you know, son, all that I have is yours. But here's the thing. Your son was dead, and now he's alive. That's the heart of God for you and me. When God calls us to that place of returning to him, that's why. Because his love for us is that deep. You can't go far enough where sin abounded, grace superabounded. It abounded all the more. And so he calls, he calls his people back to him and he says, I am with you. Now, as the letter continues, as the prophecy continues, it's important for us to interject something else here. The building of the temple resumes. And as they're going through the work and as they're doing this Revis they're coming back to the project and they're building it. Uh, there are two camps among the people. There are those who are young who are rejoicing over the fact that the temple is being rebuilt. They're getting excited about this. Uh, Ezra chapters uh, 3 and 4 speak to this as well. Uh, where the young people are singing, they're rejoicing, they're excited about what's happening. But there is a camp of older people who were around when Solomon's temple was still standing before, the, uh, before they were put into captivity. As a matter of fact, notice in chapter 2, verse 3, where the Lord asks the people here in Haggai, chapter 2, verse 3, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes? Well, back in uh, Ezra, as you read the, the book, as he's recounting this time, it did seem as nothing to the eyes of the older people who remember the former temple. Solomon's temple was a sight to behold. This one, it's a much smaller thing. And so the older people are not sharing the excitement of the younger excited kids. They're weeping, literally weeping, over the not grand nature of this new temple. Thinking, why are you guys so excited if you only saw what was before and now it's gone? We'll never be able to enjoy something like we once did. And so the Lord goes on here in Haggai and he says, Does it seem like nothing in your sight? Verse 4 Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that all the, the so 
that the treasures of all nations may come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, by the way, means speaks of him being the Lord of the armies, the defender, the one who will stand before them. Um, Imagine the hosts of the angels coming to, to defend that which God has said. He's commander, and he's talking to the people, saying, don't think it a small thing that you're working on this now. Don't think this is, this is insignificant. In fact, the greatness of this temple will be far more than the other temple. That was a big deal to say that. Remember, they're crying over this because the old one was so much better, so much bigger, so much more impressive, so beautiful. And this is so much less than that. But God says, no, this is actually going to be greater. Now, when Zechariah talks about this, and, and, and at the end of Haggai, we get the sense that this goes beyond uh, the earthly temporal temple in that. He may be talking about the millennial kingdom in as well. But at the very least, we can't miss the fact that one of the things that will make this temple greater is the fact that Jesus himself will walk in this temple area. One day... When this temple is finished and Herod gets his hands on it and expands it, it's this temple that is standing in the time of Jesus. And when he walks into the temple courts and he begins to teach in that area and the people begin to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, as they call him the Messiah, this could be him. The, the grandness of this temple because of what happens around it. The glory of the latter temple will be greater than the former now, it is possible for us, having experienced in our Christian lives and, you know, being a little bit, having a little bit of mileage on my life since I came to Christ, I can relate to this idea. Maybe you can too. But there was a time in my life, and there have been moments where I have failed in my Christian life. And there have been times I've looked back to the early days of my, of my walk with God. And I think about the richness that was there in my younger days, the excitement, the passion, the fervor. I use those words a lot. I remember what it felt like to feel that way as a young believer. Boy, you couldn't, you couldn't get me to sit down to a conversation without talking about the Lord. Everything had to do with Jesus. And it was just, there was this thing about my life that was just so, I was so, you know, in that youthful kind of excited kind of place. Now, I love the Lord. I'm excited. I'm not saying I'm in some kind of a backslide, but there have been failures along the way from which I thought, you know, Lord, here I am again. I've let you down. I've messed up. I've done things that have dishonored you. I've offended you and I've offended people and stuff. I've done things that have diminished what once was into something that I don't feel I'm ever going to be able to experience again. I've gone too far this time. The truth of the matter is, is that God can actually make up for all the years, that, like Joel would say, all the years that the locust has eaten. Everything that you thought was destroyed and could never be once again can be even greater than they once were. God can restore your life. Some of you may be living a Christian life that is nominal because you feel like, you know, I just feel like it. I just, I'm never going to get to that place that I was, so I'm just going to be content where I am. Don't you know that God can bring you back not only to where you once were, but even beyond? God can bless your life today in a way and with a degree of richness and meaning in your Christian life that is far more than you ever experienced before. The beauty of growing older in Christ is that you experience His grace deeper and deeper as you grow. You come to understand what it means to truly be forgiven and free. You start to understand that the love of God supersedes even your greatest failures. It doesn't mean it's okay that we sin. It doesn't mean it's okay that we have failed. But God's love overrides those things. And the life for a believer to experience the grace and the love of God day after day after day is something that fortifies a believer. It's something that causes us to come to him rather than walk away when we fail. God's grace is truly amazing. And his love for us never diminishes. Think about someone like Peter. 
Peter, who walked with the Lord those three and a half years, comes to the night before the crucifixion, I will never deny you. Never. These other guys, maybe. Not me. I'm never going to let you down like that. I would never imagine denying you. He didn't just deny the Lord once. He denied him three times. How do you come back from that? You know, it's, we screw up. We mess up. We think, oh, Lord, I've really let you down in some way. Peter literally denied Jesus. Denied even knowing him. Uh, you know, it says that he began to curse. It didn't mean he was using profanity. It meant he was calling down curses from heaven. If I know him, let me be accursed. That's how strongly he was denying. It wasn't like, no, I, no, you got the wrong guy. No, it was, God curse me if I know this man. That's how absolutely vehemently I'm saying I don't know him. And then he looks at me. Imagine Peter in that moment. Imagine that. The, the cock crows just as Jesus had said. He looks and, and somehow, I, I'm, I'm, one of the things I'm looking for of understanding is where they were in proximity, where their eyes could meet, where Peter could see Jesus look at him and to see what that look might have been. I don't think it was anger. I don't think it was frustration. I don't think it was, oh, Peter, Peter, how could you, I told you you were going to do this. I don't think it was anything like that. But imagine Peter's complete crushed spirit over what he had done. And then imagine after the resurrection, the angels telling the women, go tell the disciples and Peter, especially Peter, go find him and make sure he knows Jesus is alive. As Peter jumps out of the boat when he realizes it's the Lord on the shore. Throw your nets on the other side. We haven't caught anything. Throw it on the other side. <gasps> I've heard that before. He jumps in the water. He goes, he doesn't even just get impetuous as he is. How do you not love somebody who that destroyed when he has his first chance to see Jesus? He goes. And Jesus restores him. Do you love me, Peter? You know I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Three times the denial, three times the restoration. There will be failures, but for a believer, none of them is fatal. God's love for you overreaches. Let me end with a couple of thoughts here as we're starting to run out of time. A couple of things I want to kind of add to this because in Haggai we don't see it as strongly, but we do pick it up from Ezra. Uh, two things. First off, know that when you desire to walk with the Lord, when you have come back to Him and asked Him to refresh your soul, you want to walk with Him, know that there will be opposition. Know that there will be opposition that will come. Uh, the enemy will seek to do a number of things to stop you. Okay? He will seek to bring adversity to keep you from walking. There's already discouragement. We saw that in the weeping of the older people who'd seen the temple before. There was discouragement, but there's also sometimes straight on opposition. Uh, we see in the other passages where it talks about how there were those that saw that they were rebuilding the temple and the city and, uh, and those came, the adversaries, it says in Ezra, came and asked them what they were doing and when they talked about what they were doing, they said, well, let us join you. Let us come alongside. We believe in God too. And to their credit, uh, Zerubbabel Shiel, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Jeshua, they said, no, you'll have no part in the work. The adversaries had come to try and come alongside of them to do the work. But those who were walking with God said, no, you'll have no part in this. I will not allow compromise to come in and diminish the work that is going on here. And by the way, I guess I haven't said it totally overtly, but the temple and the rebuilding of the temple is a metaphor for investing in your spiritual life. Hopefully that has been clear, but let me just put it out there. That's what we're drawing as a metaphor here. Building your spiritual life and fortifying it, that it might be a place that you can worship, where it can be an expression of your worship to God. There is no place for compromise in that. There is no place for that to have a space for the enemy to have a foothold there. Do you remember in the book of Acts when Paul was going around doing the ministry that he had and, and a possessed girl came up behind him and began to advertise his meetings? And Paul cast this demon out of her. 
She was bringing money to some of the folks in the area there, and, and Paul cast the demon out of her. She was talking about how they have the great power of God. Come follow. The problem was that this woman was known to be possessed. You don't need people like that talking about your relationship with God. Hey, you should listen to this guy. He loves Jesus, said the crazy person who was totally foaming at the mouth. That's, that's what you want for a, P, a PR team, right? So Paul cast the demon out. Now she could follow. Now she could begin to, to talk about the, the power of God and such. There is no place to come alongside of anything that would compromise your relationship with God. Your testimony for Him. Your walk with Him. Your worship of Him. But that, does, that involves us taking a stand and saying, no, I will not let that compromise it. What does compromise look like in the life of a believer today? Sure, I walk with Jesus, but I, but I don't really want to talk about it publicly because it might make me look weird or something like that. Or maybe it's okay to be a Christian, but I still want to go out and do X, fill in the blank. Compromise can find a lot of ways into our lives. And we have to search our hearts and ask if there is anything. And if there is, we need to set it aside. Because there is nothing more important than that investment. And any compromise can become very costly in that. The enemy will, if he can't compromise with you then, will bring a head on assault. Again in Ezra, when they couldn't join the work, they ran back and they went to Darius and they said, hey, they're rebuilding the city and the temple and everything, and, and, and this whole thing has been nothing but trouble for their whole existence. And so Darius read the decree that had been given to Cyrus, and he went ahead and gave permission for them to go ahead and continue building, and it ultimately was completed during that time. So even though they had sought to undermine the work of God and, uh, and the work of the people of God in that circumstance, God went to bat for them. Matter of fact, it said the eye of the Lord was upon them to do the work. And so they finished it. When the enemy comes straight on ahead of, uh, straight on at you, understand that the Lord is with you. You don't have to cower. You don't have to run away. During that same time, uh, they had begun to back away from the work because the threat of them getting in trouble for finishing the work was strong. And so they pulled back. But then Haggai, and, and Zechariah talks about Haggai uh, coming alongside them, and they preached to them and encouraged them to continue doing the work. So they did. And by the time word came back that Darius was okay with it, they were underway with their work. In other words, they pressed on in the face of adversity and head-on attack from the enemy. Do you think that if you're walking with Jesus with passion and desire that you're not going to become a target for the enemy? You will. Do it anyway. Keep pressing on anyway. Don't ever let that stop you, ever. Because it's not you that's fighting. The Lord fights for you. The battle truly belongs to the Lord. He calls us to walk with him, to follow in his steps, to go where he calls us to go and to press forward and not to be threatened or intimidated by those that would seek to stop us. You think there's a context in which that could come in handy knowing today? How about everywhere? Everywhere. Go to work tomorrow and find out. My boss is here. I don't mean it, not for me, but it's great working for a Christian company. But when you go out into the marketplace, you go to work, you go to wherever you go where the world has strong representation, be a Christian there. Don't be threatened and don't and like keep your light from shining. We're not to hide our light under a bushel. Let your light so shine that men may see the good works that you do and would what? Glorify your Father in heaven. That's our call, right? That's what we do. And though the opposition come, that's what we do. And when we do, we know the eye of the Lord is upon us, and we can walk forward in confidence. So the book of Haggai, a brief letter that deserves a lot more time than just that, but for the time we have, that's it. So that said, what I'd like to do is close this in a word of prayer as we move into a time of sharing in the Lord's Supper. Um, and as we do, I want to pray that the Lord would give us a sense of desire to walk with him, to recommit, to allow him to rekindle that fire in our hearts, and that we would respond if he sends a measure of conviction to us. If there is something in our lives that has become all-consuming to us and taken a place that only he deserves, we want him to point that out and to work in us. Father, we just thank you for your grace and goodness toward us. We thank you for your patience and your love that never fails. We thank you for your love for us, Father, because it reminds us 
as we consider it, it reminds us that though we are capable of backsliding, though we're capable of putting you to the periphery in our lives, you will call after us. You'll, you'll seek to draw us back. For our part, Lord, help our hearts not to become so comfortable in that place, uh, in that kind of a place that we wouldn't respond to your conviction. Soften our hearts. Break up the hard ground, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God and a loving Father. We thank you that you go after the prodigal. You look for him to come down the road. Uh, Lord, you embrace him when he comes home and you celebrate his return. Uh, Father, if there's anyone in our midst here who is in that place, having walked far from you, Lord, help them to remember that that's your heart for them and it's for their good. So, Lord, help us to obey. Help us to respond. Help us to once again stand in awe of you, to consider your greatness, to consider your vast splendor, to be in awe of your majesty, to allow that to captivate us once again. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Renew a right spirit within us that we might glorify you and that you might be well pleased in the house that you're building within us. Father, if there's any among us that don't know you and have not experienced the day's peace, they recognize their lostness, they recognize that you're not only on the periphery, you're completely on the outs. If that's you today, there is room for you at the table. There is forgiveness, there's redemption, there's freedom, there's grace. If you'll but come and respond and receive the grace of God. Let me pray now for that. Father, repeat after me if you're, uh, if you're desiring to begin to walk with the Lord here today. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess my sin to you. I've walked far away from you. I've wanted no part of you. I've avoided you in my life. At best, I called on you in my times of trouble. But I never, ever wanted you to be close to me. But I thank you that your patience and your love would not permit that gap to exist. And so here I am, confessing my sin. And I thank you that Jesus came and took my sin upon himself. That he paid for it at the cross. And he died for me, shedding his blood. But also that he rose at the end on the third day to show me that there is life beyond the grave, that one day I'll see you face to face. Thank you for all of this, the forgiveness, the grace, and the hope. And I pray that you would give me the strength to walk with you day by day until I do see you face to face. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we uh, take a moment here as we prepare our hearts for communion. I'll invite you as we sing, as we play, to come up the middle aisle and, uh, and take the bread and the cup back to your seat around the sides. And uh, as we play, as we sing, take a few moments to come before the Lord. The beautiful thing about this is that it's a reminder. Jesus died for our sins. That's finished now. And so as we come, we remember this. He said, as often as you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. And so we look back to the cross and we say, thank you. We bring our, our, our sins this week before him and say, thank you that your grace covers this, Lord. But help me to walk with you in a way that's fresh and new and walks away from such things. This is a time of coming clean before the Lord once again and just finding that place in his grace to find restoration and strength. So as we sing and as we play, I'll invite you to come up and take your, uh, your elms back to your seat and to partake.
we're so thankful that you had saved sinners such as us. We thank you that Jesus was willing to come into this world and to take our sins upon his shoulders, to die for them in our place. Thank you for that, Father. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.